Good morning and welcome to day two of Operational Excellence Week Canada. My name is Nicole Bamford and I'm the moderator for today's session. On behalf of Leslie, Angeliki, Grant, Quinn, Candace and I, we thank you for joining us for day two of the event. This panel presentation, Accelerating Digital Transformation in Chaos, will be given by Matthew Vacare, Director, Operational Excellence at Canada Life, Amar Narain, CIO and Vice President, Information Technology at Pizza Pizza, Uma Gopanath, Head of Technology and Innovation at Lush Fresh Handmade Cosmetics, and your panel moderator will be Jonathan Bowness, Enterprise Workflow Solution Consultant at RICO. And their panel presentation promises to be well worth a listen. Before we get started, here are some quick administrative points. During the webinar, if you have questions for the panel, please submit them in the Q&A box on your screen and these will be answered during the question portion of the webinar. Likewise, for any technical issues, please write them into the Q&A section and we'll get to them right away. The widgets on your screen can be resized and dragged around for your viewing preferences. We encourage you to visit the Resource Centre on your screen for additional content and resources we and our sponsors have provided for you. So make sure you're sitting comfortably and I'll now hand it over to Jonathan so we can begin. Thank you so much, Nicole. Now, having had the chance to work with this panel leading up to today, uh, I can tell you that the experience and depth of knowledge on our, of our panelists is incredibly impressive. Uh, so I'm excited to move into the substance of today's conversation. I've got a lot of questions to ask, information to extract from our guests, so I'm going to move right into it. Now, my first question is, how has COVID impacted your business strategy? And I'll ask this to Amar first. Jonathan, um, as an organization that deals with food, COVID forced us to create another level of customer confidence in food handling. The delivery was initially a challenge in March when we had the lockdown. Um, customers were concerned about how we are handling their food, how are drivers commuting, and are they, you know, they're thinking of all the intricacies of the possibility that what, how does a driver touch that food from the stores, all the way to their Porsche, and uh, how do they actually hand it over and coming that close contact with customer? So we have to quickly understand, like, what can we do? What are these? What? How can we regain our customer confidence, especially with a crisis like this? And what we have done is um, we came out with tamper-proof box, so customer understand that. Whenever that box leaves the store, whenever it's sealed, it cannot be opened until the customer opens it. Then we have to look at contactless because customer, they don't want to touch anyone or be close proximity to a driver. So what we did, we did the contactless. And then we did the contactless uh, delivery and pickup. Um, based on that, we have to start thinking, right? Uh, typically, we have about 70% of our customers who would pay at the door, meaning you set, you give them the machine and they will swipe their card on that machine. So we have to think about, well, we want all of our customers to pay online now, although we had that feature already. But we ha also have 100% of our customer who give tips online um, at the door. So you, regardless you pay online or you pay at the door, that's where we receive our tips. And as you guys know, tips is a big part of our driver's income. So what we had to do, we have to quickly jump on, onto our e-commerce side. Uh, we have to change everything, create an option for contactless pickup, contactless delivery, and then add tips online where customer can provide their tips. And what we have done is we put a little platform when we deliver the, that order in front of the Porsche and our driver walk back and wait until the customer pick up their drive. So that's something changed the way uh, we have done business because of COVID. That's great, thank you. Um, and now, Uma, I'm going to ask you the same question. How has COVID impacted your business strategy? Thank you, Jonathan. Um, COVID has forced us to look at our strategies and our priorities uh, differently. Customers and our ethics have always been the forefront of our strategy and brand, but even more so now. Uh, we have to be able to change direction quickly as the world around us changes and the customer needs and the behavior. Soap was suddenly a product that wanted to start a COVID. 
we're all told to wash our hands often, um, to stay safe. Uh, bath bombs and shower bombs are a low-cost indulgence when you're in lockdown. Hair and face products are more important when you cannot visit the hair salon or the spas regularly. And so customers wanted to get all these products. They were queuing up to get all these products, and they had to switch to online shopping because our stores were closed at this point. And so we saw our online orders coming in. We saw a big spike. We were about 500% above our normal volume, almost on a daily basis for several weeks at the start of COVID. Um, and we had to be able to respond to this. So first of all, we had to make sure that the technology and the platforms were all managing the load. But we also needed to get creative on how to fulfill these orders um, after adding the social distancing requirements for our staff safety in both our manufacturing and our distribution locations. And then as the store started opening, we learned some new terminology that came up during COVID. You know, phase two, phase four, contactless payment, curbside pickup. And we had to pause some of the longer term work we were doing so we could pivot and um, and focus on these initiatives to make sure that we were able to fulfill our customers' needs. And this continues is forcing us to even now think about what could change between now and Christmas, and we could be ready for a uh, different scenario. That's very true. Th thank you, Uma. Um, and now, Matt, I'll, I'll ask you as well. How has COVID impacted your business strategy? Uh, thanks, Jonathan, for this question. I, I agree with Uma and Amar uh, on, on this. Uh, uh, COVID really has forced us to move everything we do towards a digital world. Our team meetings, our daily stand-ups, our problem-solving sessions, all online uh, and all remote. What's, uh, one of the challenges we see in this environment is that we don't have the opportunities to actually go and see and for those process engineers in the, in the conference, the, going to the Gemba uh, to see uh, the work and, and that's what we used to do in the past. So the key here to success is uh, to make this process visible through data. And I'm gonna be talking a bit about that um, potentially in the other questions, uh, uh, learning to see the processes and problems that come um, are extremely important uh, to drive uh, the necessary improvement. So, so moving to a, a digital world will help to uh, allow us to learn and see. So, so our our OPEX strategy really focuses on three pillars. It's, it's doing the right work. So, finding those projects uh, that um, uh, apply our capability, uh, doing the work right. So, using a methodology like Lean Six Sigma to uh, to do the work and and carry on the projects, and creating the right environment, making sure that we actually sustain. Um, the the changes that we make in, in operational excellence. So the so back to that uh, that question is really our, our our strategy is really focused on those three things. But uh, if we move to a more digital world, we get to we get to do things more remotely, um, and it'll enable us to 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 learn and, and and see where the problems arise. Yeah, that's that's great. Thank you, Matthew. Um, you know, it, it's clear that the, these current world events are having an effect on the way that that both businesses and consumers operate. Uh, but it's great to see that operational excellence strategies are still moving forward, you know, through these difficult times. Uh, the best piece of advice I've heard since COVID started is never let a good crisis go to waste. And perhaps that the current situation can serve as an impetus to get that new technology project off the ground. So thank you very much for, for your answers there, guys. Um, my next question, and I'm going to ask this to Uma first. What are the most significant obstacles or enablers your organization faces in driving digital transformation? Yeah, I, I think the <laughs> obstacles and the enablers kind of paired off um, well. The pressure of the situation was the biggest enabler. We had to do something. Um, not doing something was not an option as we had to respond quickly. Um, and legacy systems, and we all have them, are your biggest obstacle. You cannot implement things fast and get to market early with legacy systems. But they forced us you think outside the box. And when I say think outside the box, I mean think outside the box, literally outside the system's box. And, and we had to go to third party, we had to look at third party applications that offer 
uh, microservices, APIs, cloud services, that shortened our development cycles and enabled us to launch quickly to speed up the transition. Now within the organization, we are an old school retail organization that believed in bricks and mortar, and we had to switch our thinking and our processes to digital. So we launched a process around fail fast and agile delivery and brought the organization along with us. We know why our customers shop with us. When we look at our customers, our biggest obstacle there, and this continues to be so, is personalization. Our customers shop with us for the ethics and the great products we have um, and how much we care for the people, the planet, and the animals. However, not understanding our customers at an individual basis, their preferences, uh, continues to be an obstacle for us from a personalization point of view. That's great. Thank you, Uma. Um, and now, Matt, the, the same question to you. What are the most significant obstacles or enablers your organization faces in, in driving digital transformation? Yeah, I, I, uh, I agree with uh, Uma. We had, uh, there is pressure um, from from this pandemic to, to actually change. And I, I think, uh, I don't think many organizations spend enough time preparing their employees to shift into this digital world. And as such, I think we need we tend to put mechanics ahead of mindset. And um, as we move into this digital world, which, you know, mechanics are easier and simpler to implement, um, but may offer low value if you haven't shifted the mindset. So I think the uh, one of the obstacles is getting getting our, 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 our company into a mindset um, that, that will help to enable um, going into an agile world. So mindset is is more complex, the more complex topic, and it's harder to grasp. Um, and it's less tangible than mechanics. But the value is high when you start to shift thinking and culture into getting into this this new world, this new age that we live in, um, and 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 transform in a in a digital world. So I think um, we have to put more emphasis on mindset. Um, rather than just the mechanics of, of performing agile or continuous improvement, uh, and maybe shift that thinking over um, so that we could change the culture and accelerate. Wow, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Matthew. Um, and Amar, I'll pose the same question to you, please. What are the most significant obstacles or enablers that your organization faces in driving digital transformation? Um, Along the lines, what Matt was saying, like uh, digital transformation, I think the technology is the, the easiest part of whenever you're thinking of um, adding a technology or changing a legacy system, like Uma said. Um, one of the things um, that uh, I've experienced um, uh, with uh, digital transformation is, is adding that technology within the organization, but having the user adopt to it. And and that's that, that's the part where, like Matt was saying, the training, the mindset, setting that up, and and that's where we look at you know changing someone's routine um, is very difficult. Uh, we a couple of years ago we changed from a 25 year old uh, legacy ERP system, and and it was still like a DOS based program where you can hit an F5 or an F10 uh, for function, and switching over to that with the, the newer version of a, a JD Edwards. Uh, at a time, it's more point and click. So, so the, the mindset and shifting from a keyboard to a point and click was was a big uh, change for our user, especially in the finance side. And and when they look at that, they said, "Well, this is taking much longer than than they normally do with the DOS base. It's just that it's new to them, and we had them start testing and using the system six months prior to the cutover." And after we cut over, 90% of the the uh, um, errors that they were complaining about or they were reporting to our service desk were all users error. And and that is because they weren't following the process thing. And it takes time for that, that mindset to change and go through it. Um, another example I have is um, we are currently testing a, um, a dispatching system with our franchisees. And the dispatching system, what it does is uh, you, when an order is finished, you assign that order 
to the driver. It's in the system, and it, it tells you how far the dri driver is away from the store, and and it kind of gives you an estimated time when that driver comes back. So you could um, you could prepare your pizza for the next delivery. So it adds efficiency and also maintain that hot and fresh uh, freshness of that pizza. Now franchisee. They liked it at first. They they said, "Oh, it works well." Um, during uh, their slow period, they're using it. But at peak, we asked them, "Why aren't you using it?" He said, "Well, it's an extra step for us, and it's slowing on our our process during peak time." So again, I, I think they have to believe in a way that there's incentive for using it and changing that that way of doing what they were doing before to adding an extra step, but seeing that efficiency that it brings at the same time as well. Yeah. Yeah, well, see, obviously it's the people that get in the way of our technology projects, right? I couldn't agree with the panelists more. And really it's, it's change management. That's one of, one of the, if not the most critical pieces to a successful project. Um, it's been said that all human pain and suffering is due to resistance to change. And I tend to agree with this statement. You know, from end users resisting the adoption of a new process uh, to your body resisting the force of a, that moving bus that has imparted upon it uh, because you forgot to look both ways. As humans, most of us have this natural resistance to change. Uh, we have to plan for this tendency from the onset of every, every project. Um, my next question, and I'm going to ask this to Matthew first, um, is what investments have you made in the past that have enabled you to react and respond quickly to the current COVID-19 pandemic? And what advice can you give to those that are now pursuing digital transformation? Oh, that's a great question, Jonathan. A few years ago, we accelerated our digital journey by setting up uh, digital labs. And it allowed, us, it allowed us to benefit from the creation of our digitally enabled uh, products for our consumers. More specifically, we've um, launched uh, a few years ago our Simple Protect life insurance application um, that have seen large increases in uptake um, since the pandemic started. And I would say that that has been a great strategic investment for our organization to start to forward look into, um, uh, into the future and have digital applications where clients can meet with advisors and complete a life uh, term or participating life insurance application. Um, it goes without saying, the introduction to Microsoft Teams in our organization uh, a couple of years back um, has been paramount to the success and the continuity uh, to which we, we've, you know, went through the pandemic. Um, but not only that, I would like to mention that the guidelines uh, and, and really give kudos to our human resources partners, uh, the guidelines uh, around working from home um, to enable remote work um, a couple years back um, has allowed us to keep this continuity of service going. So with minimal disruption uh, within the organization. So just wanted to add that there's, you know, two things are our, our digital labs and we have a lot more digital labs stood up um, this, uh, this time now than three years ago um, to enable us with digital products to our customers and the introduction of Microsoft Teams in addition to the guidelines around how we work in a remote work environment. Thanks, Matthew. And now I'll ask uh, the same question to Amar. What investments have you made in the past that have enabled you to react and respond quickly to current COVID-19 pandemic? And what advice can you give, uh, give those now pursuing this digital transformation? Yeah, uh, Jonathan, one of our biggest uh, investments we made about three years ago was um, rewriting our e-commerce platform into the cloud. Prior to that, we had it on-premise where we were managing it, and it was already a 10-year-old system. So um, we decided to move to the cloud, uh, and one of the reasons to move to the cloud is to have that resiliency, scalability, and, and that uh, redundancy as well. But we just didn't make a move to say, hey, let's just migrate on-prem to the cloud. What we had decided to say, let's do a complete rewrite. Let's take the feature, the, take advantage of the feature of the cloud. So we, we did a complete rewrite of our platform um, using Python, using microservices, that we can see the scalability. Because if you understand our business, um, a day like a Monday is a, a fairly slow day, a day like a, a Friday um, is our highest peak of the week. 
So it, it's it's an elasticity way of looking at our business and how it it, it, it compresses and expands with the volumes of orders coming in. So when we look at that, um, we determined that, hey, we can rewrite this. It's going to take us a long period, uh, at least a two-year period to rewrite. And and when we launched, only last year, October, we launched our website. In uh, December, we launched our apps. And, and it was fairly new. And one of the premise also, as well is how do we have an agile development as well as part of this process? Because we do make changes uh, quite often, especially from our marketing. If our marketing decided to hey, we need to run a promotion, we have to be able to make uh, a fairly quick change to our system. So what we have done is, when we launched this website, we've seen the benefits right away, off the bat, that it works really well. And then came COVID. As soon as COVID hit, like I mentioned earlier, um, we had to make a lot of changes in a very short period of time. Uh, my developers, and kudos to my developers, they work pretty much round the clock to get these changes out. And and one of the biggest difference for us is not only the agile development, but we can also put in new features and new additions during our production time without impacting our customer or, or the business. And, and that's one of the reasons why I would suggest that if you're going to do digital transformation, look at it holistically. Look at it from you know, not what you already have, but what you could have. Look at the features and the, and, and the future and how you want to evolve your system as well. And that's what we have done. That's great advice. Thanks, thanks Omar. Um, Uma, to you. Can you tell us about the investments that you've made in the past that have enabled you to re react and respond quickly to, to COVID-19? And maybe give some advice to, uh, to our listeners who are now pursuing this endeavor. So I'm going to build on top of what uh, Max and Amar said there. Office 365, uh, Microsoft Teams, these came in really handy. We were able to get everyone working from home in a, in a, in a very little effort on our side to, to make that happen. We just replatformed our e-commerce solution last year, so that helped as well. But in addition to that, uh, some of the technologies and processes that we had implemented in the last several months um, enabled us to serve our customers even better. Uh, Bopis, buy online, pick up in store, we didn't have that 12 months ago. But where that came in handy, we were able to quickly repurpose Bopis to provide curbside uh, pickup. Um, when stores were opening in phase two, we were able to service customers at the front of the store using our mobile POS technology that we had implemented a few years ago. And using the in-store Wi-Fi network, we were able to service them at the front of the store without them having to come in. Uh, here's a story. Uh, if you've been to a large store, and I hope all of you have, um, you know that our staff are our biggest asset. Like they are passionate, they are knowledgeable, and make it such a fun experience for our customers. And early on in COVID, we could see from the social media that customers were actually missing that contact, that experience. And so we lost something called virtual consultations, which gives the ability for customers to book an appointment with somebody who would have, who would have, they would have talked to in the store but all our store staff were working from home, but they made that contact and, and conversation possible with our customers. And we did this in literally nine business days, from the time we thought of this concept to when we launched was in nine business days. And the most important secret ingredient there is a team that was very high on collaboration and working in an agile manner. Um, lastly, I'll say that alignment and focus are super important during this time. During normal course of business, we work on several initiatives, um, sometimes in silos. But COVID forced us to work together in cross-functional teams and choose intentionally, with great intentionality, the work that we needed to focus on. So my advice for, for others out there, um, have an innovation mindset, Keep on track with emerging technology trends and an agile team. That's what helps us be successful. And if you haven't started already, start now. Thank you. That, that's great. Um, you know, unmistakably, 
technology that helps us to work and interact with our customers remotely and distantly has had the biggest payoff when COVID hit. I've noticed my clients who already have paperless offices and processes and have this technology in place to support remote work were far less impacted. And that's especially through the onset of the pandemic when the uncertainty was at its highest. Those that didn't have this technology in place had to make a lot of decisions and a lot of changes very quickly just to keep their business moving forward the last seven months. Now, my next question, and I'm going to ask you first, Uma, is, is what opportunities do you see with the changing marketplace and digital transformation? And then how can you use technology to, to add value and enhance the experience of your customers? Thanks, Jonathan. Um, great question. There's so many use cases here of how technology can be used. We saw what happened in the early days of COVID. Restaurants couldn't get customers into their, um, into their space, but they needed to get food to their customers to stay in business. And they all latched on to services like, you know, DoorDash and Uber Eats to, to make that happen. Technology can be used in way more ways than just selling product to customers. Um, we have used it as, as last to sell our brand story, the ethics and the community work we do, um, how we make products safely during COVID, keeping our staff safe. Uh, how um, you know we donate products to frontline workers in several parts of both the U.S. and Canada. How we source our products ethically and the charitable organizations that we uh, provide grants to. The supply chain is a big area we are investing in. As a vertically integrated company, we have to make sure that we have the raw materials, the right amount, at the right place, in the right quantity to make sure we can make products and make it available to our customers when they need it, be that in retail or be that through online uh, transactions. And technology plays a really big part here because you have data along this every step of the way, you have data points. And just aggregating all of that, we are able to predict problems before they occur. We've also used technology to improve customer service, to respond to standard questions from customers, tracking their order, uh, product inquiries, and other commonly asked questions. So we've automated a lot of that using technology. Every day, there's you know, new opportunities and there's new solutions out there. So you, know, you have to stay focused on, on what's happening and see how you're gonna bring that in to solve a business problem for you. Thank you. That's a great answer, um, Amar. I'll, I'll please ask you to tell me, uh, you know, to tell me what opportunities do you see within the changing marketplace and digital transformation, and how how do you think technology can be used to add value and enhance the experience of your customers? No, absolutely. And and one of the thing we look at technology is our e-commerce. Uh, as everyone knows, COVID kind of bring that technology more to prominence, especially with. Um, online ordering, everyone jumped onto online ordering. So one of the things we look at as, as, as a company is how do we leverage our e-commerce platform, right? How do we simplify that user experience and the convenience? Because we focus a lot on the convenience part. And, and part of this is we use that data that we have to do target marketing. Uh, and part of that is engaging the customer. And, and the intention there is, you know, look at, you know, increase that frequency that a customer purchase from us. Maintain that uh, customer retention because it's a very highly competitive environment we're in or a business we're in. And um, one of the thing is, how else can we create a self-serve service? Because we look at AI for a call center. Think of um, conversational AI. You could, uh, a customer when they call into our call center, they could speak to um, um, an automated system that sounds like human have that human-like uh, voice and they can place their order. And one of the benefits of that, it reduces um, errors in customer orders. And it also, it's a significant cost saving on labor and the call center side as well. If you look at the website, we could also use a, a chatbot uh, with, um, with AI. Uh, customer could place order uh, with the feel of a human, uh, thinking that like a human is responding to them. So these are, opportunities for us that we are looking at actually to implement and add as customers are 
gravitating more and more towards the um, the e-commerce platform and online ordering. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Now, Matthew, what opportunities are you seeing within the changing marketplace regarding digital transformation? And how do you think the technology can be used to add the value to uh, the value and experience for your customers? Thanks, Jonathan. You know, uh, I, I agree with both Uma and Amar uh, on this. Uh, and I just want to add that superior product is not the differentiating factor in this changing marketplace. Um, in our world, product plus service are key factors in defending our brand uh, in the market. Customers are relying on product, but more importantly, an exceptional customer experience. Um, as I mentioned before, technology can enable us by providing visibility through data uh, to understand how the customer ex experience can be improved or whether it can offer, whether we can offer it at a lower cost um, and through automation um, to remove manual work. So these are the types of things that, uh, you know, we're looking at. Um, again, it's, it, it's around, you know, not only selling a, a superior product, but having a uh, monumental experience for that customer. That's fantastic. Thanks. You know, data, data, data. And, and we certainly have a lot of it today. And we're going to have exp exponentially more of it tomorrow. And the leaders of tomorrow will be those that can drive business intelligence out of this wealth of data and turn this into value for their clients and partners. I think you've all highlighted that, and that's incredible. Um, you know, I have a question for, for Uma, and I think this one's, um, you know, this one's a great one for, for her. I want to know, how do you think one can foster a culture that accelerates technology adoption? Thanks, Jonathan. Um, we need to build a culture of push and pull between technology and the rest of the business. And what do I mean by that? Um, technology teams, typically IT teams, have been used to taking orders. And we've got to change that around the middle. As my boss puts it, he says, technology is the straw that stirs the drink. So what we need to do is look at external trends, have a small team, and that's what we're doing, have a small team that's trusting out new concepts and putting this in front of our business to solve business challenges. Uh, sometimes the challenge that you didn't even know existed in your business. That's how you lead, and, and then you focus on the early adopters. These are your influencers who are going to make this change accelerate through the organization and cascade it through the organization. So identify them in your organization, in your different teams, and keep them close. As one innovator puts it, and I'm going to read a quote here, uh, disruptors are never satisfied with the status quo. They are the ones who constantly ask, what if and why not? They're not afraid to challenge conventional wisdom, and they don't disrupt things for the sake of being disruptive. They do it to make things better. And to that, I'm going to add, you only need a culture of dealing with disruption. That's great. Thank you. So, Amar, I'm going to ask you a question that builds on that. You know, how do you identify and develop the digital skills and capabilities that your organization needs? Um, first, um, good question. And um, if you think of our business, uh, like I mentioned throughout uh, this uh, thing, technology is a critical factor in, in engaging, you know, in, in engaging our customer, growing our business. It, it's imper imperative that we continuously look at different technology to create uh, uh, customer convenience and cost saving for a franchisee. There are technology gaps in, in some parts of our organization, but with the budget constraint, we're in a retail, our, our margins are a razor sharp thin. So we do have to choose based on what we have and what project we focus on. And as a result of that, we, we focus a lot on customer facing. That's where we see we can grow our footprint and increase revenue for our business as well. And a lot of focus goes in that. So we have to align our skill set internally. Um, like I said earlier with the COVID question, you know, I have my own internal development team. Whenever there's a request or something, they have to um, really respond to our business. And, and that's one thing we look at is how do we 
improve their skill set, maintain their skill set, and focus those guys in a specific area of the business as well. And and then we work with our our partner, you know, which is our marketing department. You know, they have done the digital marketing aspect of this too. So how do we maintain that with them and evolve them as well on the technology side? So from a development standpoint, we see research and keeping up with the latest technology is one way to concentrate on technology. Um, another way is, you know, we work with key partners to leverage their expertise and solution. And, and I, I think a big part is you, you have to be in the technology, understand the technology, and most important of all, understand your business processes and where your business is going. That's great. Thank you. So I think I have time for, for one more question, and I'm going to ask this to Matthew. Um, how can a digital world drive operational excellence? Matt, I think you're muted. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll move on, and I'm going to ask another question that I think is very interesting that's come out of our uh, out of the Q and A. I'll ask it to Uma first, and, and quickly, we've got about thirty seconds for you. What are some of the positive developments from a delivery and an engagement perspective that you think will continue in the post-COVID world in your organization? Um, Cross-functional team, um, agile delivery, continuing to look at external technology trends, and doing work in small chunks rather than taking these big rocks of projects that we that we want to do. Um, constantly delivering value and making sure that you are actually delivering value for the work that you put in and not hesitate to cancel a project if it's not delivering on its, um, on its objectives. That's great. Thank, thank you. Amar, I'll, I'll give it to you quickly for 20 seconds. What do you think, out of COVID-19, what are some of the positive developments that came out that are going to stick around at Pizza Pizza? Um, uh, one of the thing is uh, quick thinking. You know, I, I think uh, exactly what Umar said. You, you need to have that uh, cross-functional uh, functional system going. Um, agile, um, something we definitely um, have planned for, and it worked out really well for us. And um, and and we learn a lot too from it. And and what we need to do going next, because. Um, with uh, a crisis like this, um, it was, uh, you know, no one planned for it. And uh, one of the thing is how do we maintain, because work from home was something that we always have with our agents working from home, but having the entire corporate staff working from home, that was a, a little bit of a challenge for us as well. So these are things that we learned and, and I, I'm pretty sure our HR team is also looking at some of the processes and renewing it. So. You know, uh, having working together, making that plan, being reactive, um, you know, it, it's very important. I know before COVID, we were always talking about proactive, but COVID made us reactive. And that's where we see the, the, the mindset of everyone coming together and working together. Well, I definitely think we're all going to be a little uh, better prepared to work from home the next time the need arises. <laughs> Um, I think that's all the time we have here, folks. Uh, I hope everyone gained some valuable insight from the conversation. I hope you had some fun along the way. And I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank everyone in attendance. Uh, thank you so much for spending the time with us with, uh, uh, with us today. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Matt, Amar, Uma, and Jonathan, for your interesting and informative panel discussion. For those in the audience, if you'd like to listen again, this webinar will be available on demand shortly. And finally, thank you to you wherever you are for taking the time to listen in. We look forward to seeing you on our next session starting in 35 minutes. Um, and again, thank you, Matt, Amar, Uma, and Jonathan for a great presentation. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.